Uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about my progress in systematically and proactively testing variant effects for AIR, the unknown regulator. So first I want to introduce the variant effect on the horizon. And so uh, most of you are biomedicians, and I'd like to really, I think you, you are the group that is most likely to appreciate these, this information. Um, I'm a wet lab person, but we need the help of biomedicians for this specific aspect of it. So uh, the issue and the crisis currently is that most variants in Clinvar, which is a database of human genetic variants that are impacted in human health, most of those variants are variants of uncertain significance. And this is less useful for patients and also clinicians in advising for, uh, for improving patient comparisons and also for improving treatment. Because something like benign or pathogenic, clinicians know what to do with that. For a variant of uncertain significance, we don't have as much information about what to do with that patient. And so, over time, the variants are only increasing over time for the variants of uncertain significance because uh, more and more people are getting sequenced. And so we really need help trying to interpret the data that we're collecting about these variants. And so currently, when a patient comes to the clinic, and if there's usually in most cases, there's no clinical evidence for that variant, the likelihood of returning a variant of uncertain significance classification is really high. If there is some functional evidence for that variant, or if some is gathered, which can take months or years, then the chance of returning a variant of uncertain significance is lower. And so what we aim to do in the Roth lab is generate these big variant effect maps for disease-associated genes, where the score is indicated by the color, and the, uh, the so along the protein, you have all amino acid changes possible. The wild type is in yellow, and then the more deleterious ones are in blue, and the more synonymous likes are in white. And so that way we can functionally evaluate all variants before the patient comes. So that's the idea. And so just to show you a slice of this issue, I am focusing on one gene called the autoimmune regulator. And just as a brief introduction, it's involved in T cell development. And so T cell progenitors, they come from the bone marrow and they travel to the thymus, which is an autoimmune organ located between our lungs. And here the interaction of the T cells with the thymic epithelial cells is really important for its proper development. And so once it's developed, it can go and attack pathogens. So, but when it's in the thymus, it's really important that the T cell develops here and learns what's around the body. This is an autoimmunity prevention method that um, air is involved in. And so what the autoimmune regulator does, it's a transcriptional coactivator. So it finds many complexes and helps with regulated genes in the thymus to present that to the T cells. And so if the T cell can see that, that means it would be autoreactive and it should be deleted. So how this works um, is the autoimmune regulator pulls out things from all around the body. And this, you can appreciate how cool this is because it's upregulating things from repressed chromatin that shouldn't be expressed in different cell lines. So for example, you can have hair follicle cells expressed in thymus and you can have insulin expressed in thymus just so that we can see what T cells bind to it and delete those. And so if the autoimmune regulator isn't working right, what you can have is the self-reactive T cell gate and they go and circulate and cause this symptom, um, this disease called, called autoimmune polyendocrine syndrome in table. Mm -hmm. And so we know some variants that do cause the disease. And this is a rare autosomal recessive disease. And um, I won't get into it because I don't have the time, but what, what's really important to note here is that sequencing is increasingly sure. used to diagnose it because it's a monogenic disease and we do have a dose of you know, monogenic benign variants. And so of the missense variants annotated in ClinMark, 78% of them are variants of uncertain significance. So it's, an, it's increasingly important to understand what the variant, how the variant function ahead of um, the presentation of the patient. And so my aim was to generate a variant like that for here. And so um, to do this, I first generated a library of all, almost all possible missense variants of error using a codon degenerate algo pool where NNI is centered on each codon. And then that was integrated into the reporter cell line. And briefly, the reporter is made up of the insulin promoter, which is just one of the genes that does not regulate. Uh, tag and so I integrated this reporter into one of one landing pad. So this is sort of a really easy recombination site that something you can get integrated into. And then from another landing pad site, which is in another state, our locus, I express the army regulator. And so this is just a test of a set of variants that I know are benign or pathogenic. And this was a proof concept to see that this reporter can separate those benign and pathogenic variants based on the level of GFP expression. So the benign variants are shifted further to the right than the pathogenic. And this allowed me to select a gate, an arbitrary gate that can enrich for those functional variants. So these 
plots don't have to separate perfectly between the benign and pathogenic. I just need to be able to sort with the, with the flow cytometry sorter. Um, the, for, for fluorescence, I can sort and enrich for those functional variant. So knowing that, I could then do this in high throughput. So I put the whole library of all sense variants into the reporter cell line, and I sorted for this functional bin versus all cells. And this allowed me to calculate the allele frequency of cells in the high bin versus the all bin. And using a pipeline developed in our lab called Tile Seek Mute, I was able to calculate a fitness landscape for the other regulator. Okay. So I'll walk you through it. So this, this gene is it's really long. So um, I'm just going to sit you through it. But the first part is just to help you read this. The bottom row is nonsense variants. The rest of them are missense variants. They're categorized by hydrophobic here, over here, charged in the middle. And the more deleterious the variant change, the more blue it is, the more closer to wild type it is, the whiter it is. And then the uh, wild type itself is in yellow. So the first domain is really important for multimerization. And without multimerization, it can't function. So it's promising that the map is able to recapitulate that. It's really deleterious. So moving on, we know that there's a bipartite and clear localization signal for air. And the part that's functional is only these three amino acids. This one has shown to not be essential for function in the literature. So that supports the literature. There's these two types that we're not sure what they mean yet. They're showing up as deleterious. So it would be interesting to know what, what exactly is happening there. So don't know that yet. Um, moving on, there's the SAN domain. So this is a divergent DNA binding domain. So there was a lot of debate in the literature whether there is a transcription factor that binds DNA or if it's just a coactivator that doesn't bind DNA. And right now, the, the literature says that it's not binding DNA because the SAN domain is divergent and it's not able to localize to DNA and bind it. There's an alpha helix change there. So, uh, so other than that, this domain is interesting because it interacts with different proteins. And um, air has a lot of interactors. But here, you can see that the patch that's the darker part here, this is hydrophobic residues. So changes to hydrophobic residues look damaging in this area. And then in the disordered region, it's more tolerant of variation. But there is a patch here in the disordered region that's intolerant to charged residues. So uh, that's pretty interesting because uh, this is not something we can capture by structure and solvent because um, the Ottoman regulator also doesn't have a solid structure yet. It has some domains that are solved, but not all. Okay, so this domain is the PhD1 domain. So this interacts with repressed chromatin markers, so binds in the system. And here it's not captured as well as I'd hope in the map, and this might be a limitation to where the reporter is in the genome because we're not sure where the site is, where the safe marker is. So this might be a limitation to the map, but there are some patches that are captured here. So um, I'm still looking into this to see if, if we would expect something else, but it, it looks I guess this is this is the way the reporter capitulated it, and maybe this is just a limitation of it. Okay, PhD two domain. So this is the domain involved in protein interactions. And what's cool about this is that if you notice, most of these deleterious residues are cysteine in in the third last row, and so changes from cysteine seem to be damaging, and that involves uh, suggests that there is a prevention of this by bonds, such as. Okay, and so at the end, we have this eternal domain, and so this is the domain that doesn't have a name exactly other than the eternal domain, but it's been annotated uh, to have a uh, very important trend So I'm happy to talk about this later because I don't, I have limited time, but I do have any questions. Okay, and so I did do some validation and characterization of the variant effect map. So just getting into it, first of all, there's no full structure solved for air. This is the alpha prediction. You can appreciate that it's not very confident. There's a lot of disorder as well, all the squiggly lines. So I painted the average score at each position on the alpha prediction. And what I saw was that most of the helices that we know, where, where the alpha helices we know are found in the middle, you have more deleterious residues there. And then what I was curious about was, is there any regions that are disordered that have uh, intolerance to variation? And there are some, it's kind of hard to see, but for example, here, this is this is the nuclear localization site. Um, and then there's some other patches that I don't really know about yet, so I'm still exploring that. And also, if you zoom into the zinc binding site of air, you can appreciate that some of the residues near the zincs are intolerant to variation. So Interaction of these things is important for function because it is a zinc finger uh, boji, one of the joints of this. Okay, so 
Then I needed to know, can the map predict the known pathogenic and benign variants of the known based on twin bar data? And so here, if, if you're not familiar with precision recall curves, the better the predictor or the map is doing, the closer it is to the top right section of the, of the square. Um, so what this is, is uh, precision is the proportion of variants of the map most damaging that are actually pathogenic. And then recall is the proportion of pathogenic variants that are observed to be damaging in the map. And this line at 90% precision and where the map or the predictor crosses it is how good it's doing at predicting those variants. And so the variant effect map is performing better than ESM1B, which is one of the best computational predictors of variant effects, which is um, it's a unsupervised model. And then SIFT and Pruvian are the uh, conservation-based predictors of variant effects. So um, then if we're reading that path, you're chilling in some of the known Some of the known variants. OK, and so I'm almost out of time. Um, so what we can then do is see how many of those variants can we give evidence for for being pathogen benign. And you can do this by looking at um, these kinds of um, log likelihood ratios. So what you can do is plot the benign variants. And those each line is a benign variant in green, and then each line is a pathogenic variant in pink. And the missense variants from the, from the map are overlaid. And then you can see that uh, the variants that are overlapping highly with the benign distribution are more likely to be providing evidence for benign strong classification. So um, overall, there is a there is a good amount of variants that are overlapping in both sections. So it's it's having some impact, hopefully, with that. So um, yeah, and yeah, moving on, I want to develop a scoring system to uh, for validating the severity of APS1 in the fishing cohort. So I have access to a fishing cohort in Norway that hasn't been evaluated, hasn't been put on the yet. And then also analyze potential genotype and genotype limits to see if the films are more likely to be together with some uh, variants. Okay. So um, thanks so much for listening. Um, yeah, so in conclusion, I uh, this pro map promises to provide functional evidence to support clinical variant interpretation for this one. And I'd be happy to take any questions.